This is Pamela Kime from Grand Tap Media, and I'm going to say a few words about Captain Tom Burke from the United States Navy before I begin my interview with him on Breathe in the Grand Show. Captain Tom Burke is a native of Royal Oak, Michigan. Today, he resides in West Michigan. He earned a political science degree at the University of Michigan. He went on to earn a master's degree in public administration from Harvard University. He was commissioned through the Aviation Officer Candidate School to become a helicopter pilot. He did two deployments, and one in Western Pacific and the other in Indian Ocean. His shores of duties included an assignment as an intern at the Joint Chiefs of Staff during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Later, he was working at the Pentagon during 9-11 and the beginning of the Iraq War. He went on to earn a degree in nuclear engineering in order to advance he served as the first executive officer of the USS George H.W. Bush, went on to command the USS Blue Ridge, and then the, was, the, was the commander of the USS Ronald Reagan. He has earned many personal awards and accommodation medals. He is truly an American hero, and I am honored to have him on Breathe in the Grand Show. Hello, West Michigan. This is Breathing the Grand Show. My name is Pamela Kime from Grand Tap Media. The show was produced by Kime Concept. And the spirit of the show is to introduce West Michigan to their neighbors. And boy, do I have a very, very special neighbor for you to meet um, today. And he lives in West Michigan. And again, I'm so honored to have him because it is something dear to my heart is the veterans, the military, um, uh, forces for our country, the people that protect us, and he is a captain in the U. Was a captain in the U.S. Navy, and I want to introduce you today, Captain Tom Burke. How are you? <laughs> How are you? And I just cut that a little bit short so you can go on to what you do because I want to make sure that I give you all the accolades because David and I, uh, um, if you um, know that Dave, Tom is a dear friend of ours. Um, David thinks you're an American hero, and so do I. So let's just tap right in. This is what we do in the spirit of the show. I know I've had your wife on. If anybody remembers, I had uh, Laura Burke, who is a wonderful artist, and uh, on my show. And uh, the spirit of the show is that we just want to tap in like we would just meet, and we were your neighbor. And what would you say about yourself as I got to know you? So we're going to put it off to you. So you would tell us. Exactly. Why did you get into? Why did you want to be a captain and, and go into the military? Was it your family? And uh, as David joked, did you watch? You know, Officer and a Gentleman, and saw, well, you know, I, I, <laughs> Richard Gere yeah. and, <laughs> and yeah. Deborah Winger, and say, you know what? That sounds like a great career. And I grew up with Top Gun, and I thought that was a, a wonderful um, Navy um, movie too. So I'm going to leave it yeah. to you to start this off here. All right. Well, I'll start with Top Gun. I was already in uh, flight school when Top Gun came out. Okay. It's shocking how many inaccuracies <laughs> there are in that movie. How many things are actually not true, and they take your wings, and you'd never fly again. But oh. it's Hollywood, so there you go. No, no. Um, I, uh, I graduated Michigan as a political science major, was interested in the CIA or the FBI, things like that. I talked to the CIA, and they said, well, you're not ethnically interesting. You don't speak any interesting languages. You don't really have a skill set that you know, we need. You should go to the military or go to law school. Really? Like wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I went to law school. I have never, probably never told you this. I don't talk about it a lot. But uh, I was in first year law school, really enjoying it, very interesting. But I knew I didn't want to be a lawyer. I, I knew it was just a means to an end. And I was taking out student loans, and I'm, you know, I'm, all those debts coming in. Meanwhile, President Reagan at the time really wanted, was really building up the military. Um, go, go into a 600 ship navy and I started thinking you know I could join the service for four years and qualify for the CIA or the FBI and not have to get a bunch of student loan built up so I finally 
got over the incredibly painful process of doing the application, which was just, you know, at that time in my life, at that age, it was like an impossible do, oh fill out God. this massive application, uh, and sent it in and got accepted. And uh, my dad talked me into trying flight school, even though I'd never flown anything in my life. Okay. And uh, I finished first year finals, did fine, and never went back. So I did first year law school, I never went back for second and third year. I and where to, was this at? U of M? Florida. Was it? Was no, it was at Wayne State. Wayne State. Uh, okay, yeah, so you're yeah. still in Michigan. Uh -huh. Really? Yeah. Well, I'm glad yeah. you didn't become a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, at the time, I thought I'd wasted a year of my life. You know, here I am. I'm off track now. I'm going to uh, the Navy. I just wasted a year. It turns out that was completely not true. I, I learned right. so much of how to, how lawyers think, why they think the way they do, how to look at both sides of an issue, how to try and dispassionately see, advocate for either side of a point of view, I learned a ton and it really served me well in my career. But at the time, I thought I'd wasted a year. So right. I went to the Navy for four years and never looked back. I just, I, I just had such a great time and great career and so many engaging things to do and so many d diverse things to do. But when you went into the Navy, I mean, did you, wa did you know you wanted to be a captain of a, uh, explain, mm -hmm. I mean, that is such, mm -hmm. I, Honestly, I will have to say when, when uh, we met, and David, <coughs> my husband David, when I refer to him, talked about, you know, well, he was the captain of US, USS Ronald Reagan. I'm like, okay, and then he pulls up the US Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. on, the, on the screen, on the, on, the, on the computer. I'm like, oh my gosh. I mean, do people, tell us about that. I mean, what it, that's a, uh, how many people are you overseeing? And what, did you always have that dream to do that? Uh, no, I, I, Again, I was going to get out of the Navy, but I just had so much fun. I enjoyed it. But a as I went through my career and decided, okay, I'm going to stay in now. What's the path for me for the future? Right. Um, I had, you know, we talk about glass ceilings, and, and there are a lot of them out there besides the ones we commonly refer to. Well, in my case, I was a helicopter pilot in the jet pilot world on the carrier. So how am I going to get to command an aircraft carrier as a helicopter pilot? Right, right. I had to, you know, really think about that. I really had to kind of plot a strategy to, to be competitive to do that. Uh, so I ended up being the third or fourth helicopter, nuclear helicopter pilot ever to command a carrier. So it's all happening now, but for, uh, 10 years prior to it all starting to happen, I had to sort of see that it was going to be possible eventually someday. Okay. And so I had a mentor who got the first carrier, uh, a guy named Jim McDonald I learned a lot from, uh, and, um, amongst so many others along the way. Did they look at you and thought, you know what, they got them to know you? It's like, okay, you would make a great... Well, yeah, I mean, you know, you know you, you, your mentors, right, they like you. That's why they're mentoring you. <laughs> right, uh, right. So, uh, you know, they, they saw something in me, and they thought I had potential to, to do well and move on. And so, so yeah, they were, they were certainly encouraging and, and gave me, uh, helped me get to the next level after, um, after I thought about doing it. Okay, and so when you're getting into it and you're going into your career, they, is that when you, let's get down to... Right there, you may have to. You know, you're going to have to when you stay in the Navy, but you still want to have your your personal life, right? And yes, when you met Laura, how does did she know you at that time when you were going through that? That uh, uh, I met Laura in 1990. I was in the Pentagon. Okay. I was doing an internship at the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, in fact, I showed up to the Joint Chiefs six days after Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Wow. I was assigned to uh, the. Western Pacific to help at that time we were closing the Philippines, the U.S. bases in the Philippines. Okay. I was assigned to a, uh, a one-star admiral to help him with the base closure process. I did that for a morning. I got my pencils arranged in my desk. I got everything <laughs> arranged. And there was an army colonel in the shop next door who was dealing with this crisis of, of Iraq invading Kuwait. Right. And he said, I, I hear there's a new intern on the staff. I want him. And so I, I I got. To, I met the admiral. I spent two hours in my in my new office, and then I moved to a different office. And then I worked seven days a week for the next year, uh, as we built up the coalition, conducted the campaign in, in Iraq and Kuwait, and then uh, terminated the war in, in the terms we did. Uh, Colin Powell was the the chairman. So did you get to meet all there. of these gentlemen? Oh, I got to meet, meet a lot you know? of them. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, president. Did you get to see the? Did you get uh, deal with the I, president? I met the president years later when I was the executive officer of George H. W. Bush. He came out several times while we were building his ship. Okay. So I met him a number of times when I was the XO of the ship, but I'd never met him when I was an intern, though. No. Wow. And did, 
I mean, okay, so you were you started way back then with that the war there. We don't even hardly hear about that anymore because we're still dealing with, mm -hmm. you know, Iraq right <coughs> now with the um, twenty year mm -hmm. war. I mean, did you did you know it was going to be an? Did you when we left there? Did they really think that it was <coughs> done, or we knew we were going to deal with this later down the road as we we led up to nine eleven, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I was pretty fortunate in that sense that. You know, of course, I, I, I didn't feel fortunate. I wanted to be on the, out there in, in the cockpit, right, doing stuff. I'm sitting here in the staff job during this war. <laughs> Everybody else is out there fighting the fight. You know, right, right? So right. I feel like I'm on the sidelines. But I learned a lot about how you do kind of grand strategy, how you really think about how to put the pieces in place for a campaign, do it right, and end it right uh, in Iraq. And then so after 9-11, believe it or not, I was back in the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Now I'm quite a bit more senior, still pretty junior though. I was still a, a young or a uh, lieutenant commander, commander. Okay. Um, and 9/11 happens. Well, I was the desk officer for Central Asia and Afghanistan on 9/11. Where were you? In when the Joint I... Chiefs again, in the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But so, where were you personally? Where, where were you well, standing when in, you saw? Uh, it? I was well. I was stationed in the Pentagon. But on the day of the bombing, on the day of the plane flying into the Pentagon, I was actually on the beat in Virginia Beach with my kids. Vacation. On, on vacation. <laughs> what and, was your thought? So, well, the whole family, you know, we were all just staring at the TV, and I said, well, we're going to freak out about this. And I said, and by the way, my vacation's over. You know, i got to go back now. Uh, right. So I went back to work the next day. Oh. Um, and then I worked seven days a week for the next eight months until I, le until I left that job. Oh, my <coughs> gosh. I, I couldn't even imagine. I mean, being a, we were so, you know that, as, as yeah. the Americans, we were so afraid when that happened. Um, I don't know how much you can share, but did, did they kind of did they know something was possibly like this could happen? I mean, oh, they yeah. always talk about oh, yeah. it, you know. But they did they did they know this oh, was yeah. going to be? Yeah. So, you know, uh, Bin Laden had done the bomb, two bombings in Africa. He'd done the World Trade Center, or another building in New York prior to that, where right. he tried to hit one end of it and have it topple and didn't work. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I in the summer before 9/11, so this is the uh, the summer of '01. We were trying everything we could think of to find that guy and get rid of him. The U.S. Okay. government was. Okay. You know, we were trying very hard. Okay. And he got us first, in my opinion. That's that's kind of how it went down. When you saw that, did you, you were you surprised at where they targeted or how well they targeted or you know? Because I look at it when we saw both of those go down, it was just like, oh my gosh, you know, it's just these people aren't. You know. I mean, it was a, it was a good plan. Uh, uh, I mean, the Pentagon guy actually didn't do a good job. He, the, the plane actually hit the ground and then slammed into the Pentagon. Right, Could right. He have done a lot more damage if he hadn't uh, basically landed early. <coughs> exactly. Um, and then we go into, um, well, quickly, I mean, I, I'm jumping here because um, I know you and we've talked many times, but I want to make sure I get these these uh, these questions right on on on. on so everybody can get to know who you are and everything like that. But 9-11 hits, and now we're in, to be honest. I mean, the military is to protect us, and that's what we trust that they do. And but this war has gone on for 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, do, do, do you see, I know you, I know you have your, you know, what you can say, what you can't say, how we, how we went into this and, and forever. But we, we were ready to go into it. I know that as American, I wanted to make sure that this wasn't going to come any closer than it did in New York City and and uh, but what, what's your thoughts about it going for 20 years do we have I mean well, do we have a, an exit plan do yeah. we have a what's a, what's a what's a vision of victory in what is mind, that in my mind it's a you know it's a it's if you want to talk about today it's one thing if you want to talk about back then it's another right when I write my book which I never will <laughs> uh, I, I, I find it pretty tragic because I, I had had that experience in 1990 as a young officer watching how things need to, need to happen. And so I actually knew what to do on 9-11. Uh, I was, nobody knew anything about Afghanistan. So next thing you know, I'm in the front of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs or the vice chairman on a daily basis, briefing them on what's going on, what we need to do po po policy-wise. Right, right. I was right. in the J-5 shop, which is the strategy and policy shop, not the operations shop. So I wasn't planning moving tanks on battlefields. I was planning the strategy and the diplomacy pieces. Uh, and in my view, back then, and I advised all the three and four stars, uh, we had no business trying to fix Afghanistan. You know, it was not, it, it's on the other side of the world. We don't, our, our national interests are not really engaged in that part of the, in that, in that country, really. 
we had to go kill some bad guys. Right. Uh, and then, I th and in my view, we needed to just l get out of there, right? Or at a minimum, uh, maybe make some kind of effort to solidify Kabul, which is the capital of Afghanistan. But forget about trying to secure the whole country. And, and uh, we actually held that policy together pretty well until I left. And then as, as I went back to the fleet after that job, I'd read the paper, increasingly discouraged at how we were expanding our operations. We were going on to do more and more things. We were moving on into Iraq. All things that I felt were overextending. Um, so what, what it, we really needed to do. But how do we the keep them from from training in those countries? I mean, some of the terrorists that we hear that they're well, we they're can, being they're, say, yeah, they're yeah, being allowed you know. to do that. I I don't know as Americans yeah. how do you fix <clears> that? So that's the you know the, the, well that is the conundrum and that, but but there are. That ha that's happened in all kinds of places around the world. It wasn't uh, th then and now. Right, right. Not just Afghanistan. So we're going to we're going to say that we're going to get the terrorists and those who harbor them, which is what the words we used. Uh huh. Well, that's a that's a heck of a charter there. There's a big there's a lot. You're, of, yeah. you're, now you're driving yourself into the Sudan, <laughs> Somalia, right. Iran, n the North Korea, uh -huh. right? You you got a big agenda. Yeah. And do you have the national power to do all that? Right. And the well, answer to that is no. You don't. Right. So, so we, you have to, you have, we have to stop getting crazy in our objectives. And we've had, you know, we've had some remarkably successful uh, times where we're good at that. W Iraq won. We were good at that. We didn't try and go take down Baghdad. We okay. We backed off and we maintained. So you agreed the, with that one? I agreed Just with to that, go with, yeah. okay. We maintained, maintained a good peace because we knew that the balance between the Kurds, the Shia, and the Sunnis in Iraq was going to be a, a puzzle that would be very hard for us to solve. Right. It turns out when we tried to do it, it was very hard for us to solve. Right. right. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, well, Russia couldn't. I mean, <coughs> Russia couldn't do well in Afghanistan, Afghanistan either. You know, whatever. Ru forever. Russia failed in Afghanistan. The Brits failed in Afghanistan. If you, one of my favorite books, I think I mentioned to David, uh, the Great Game. Yeah, we were going to get that. Is about Great the British game. expeditioning into out of out of the Indian subcontinent in India to uh, Central Asia and meeting the Russians there and meeting. Emirs from the different tribes in Afghanistan, um, and often ending very badly <laughs> because they overextended and they didn't really have a plan. Uh, you know, Afghanistan has been a number of tribes for about, about ever, and so the goal of trying to unify it was always fragile, and we never were willing to commit the national power to do it. If we were willing to commit it, like we did in Japan and yeah. Germany after World War II, it, we could do it. But mm -hmm. that's what it takes. You, it's not just the military power. You, you have to build a judicial system, a police system. You have to build an infrastructure that can support uh, for a generation. Right. And then you got a shot, right? We weren't, we weren't willing to do any of those things other than break stuff and kill people, and that, that won't get you there. No, and uh, so when you were in all of this, you know, um, back in 9, 2000, I mean, Gosh, 1990s, I keep going back there. And now we're in this, and you were there after 9-11. Are you, can I just ask you, does the military work very, the, all the armed forces, do they really work as a unit to try to get things done? Because, you know, I'm looking at you, you're in the Navy, and then we have yeah. people, we have friends that are in, you know, we're in the Marines, they're in the, you know, the and the Coast Guards and, and uh, all the other forces. And I'm saying, you want to, as American, you want to visualize that we're all, we're all working to win this thing, or we're right. all, I mean, is, when you're in it, is that, is, I'm hoping that that's what's happening. No, it is, it is, <laughs> it, it, and it, it, it is, and we in fact do work very well together, good. even though we're very different, and we're, right. very, we're very parochial, and we're very good at, you know, I, I was uh, talking earlier about how I went to Michigan, and I got three boys going to Michigan State, right? There's one day a year, that's a problem. The rest of the year, I fly both flags. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm good to go, right? So, right, right. So uh, I can't say the same thing about Ohio State. Well, but we I can are, say it about Michigan State. We're, we're so, on the same so, umbrella. So right? you're parochial. You've got different services. They've got their agendas and their interests. But when it when it when it's game time, everybody comes together. And we learned that the hard way because we used to not be able to do that very well. We had some bad operations in the in the 70s, the early 80s, and in 1986, the Goldwater Nichols Act came out, which restructured the Joint Chiefs of Staff in such a way that it made it a, a, a truly joint command. Uh, the best officers we have go there. Right. You get some great professionals who really know their business and, and our, and our com combatant commands now in uh, Central Command and Pacific Command, et cetera, are joint commands. 
So they're, they're running joint operations, and you rarely see uh, any, any significant kind of parochialism other than on game days kind of, kind of stuff. Okay, so, so then, yeah. you, so after 9-11, and then you're working um, inside the Pan Pentagon, you work in a joint, then you, how did you end up on, a, on the U.S. Ronald Reagan? You know, <laughs> how did yeah. that go? How, tell us how yeah. that journey started, where so, now you're deployed yeah. out there. And, uh, yeah, so uh, the, that, that is why I stayed in the Navy, actually, is that I wasn't just flying all the time. I wasn't just driving ships all the time. I got to go do these really interesting policy jobs, right, right as well. So I'd fly for a couple of years, and then I'd go do something totally different, where I'm flying a desk, but I'm doing really interesting stuff for a couple of years. Then I get back in the cockpit, and then I go back to a staff job, you know, so you're back and forth thing. Well, was uh, it the, them pulling you in, saying, Tom, we have this special, we want you here, or was it you wanting to... No, it's a career track. I mean, okay. if, if, you, if you were stayed at sea your whole career, okay. you know, forget about a marriage, right? I mean, you know, it's hard enough. Yeah. We had to talk being about gone that. for six, eight, nine months at a time, but, you know, you got to come to shore duty eventually. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and so a lot of folks who are, in my case, are pilots, uh, will come to a, a flying job ashore. I, I never did that. I'd, I'd go to a, I, I scratched that CIA itch, if you will, where I went to a strategy policy okay. job where I could, you know, interact with the CIA, the interagency, the, the FBI, the State Department, and, and work on national policy in a region and why we were doing what we were doing. Uh, and for me, that was fascinating. But uh, all those things, if you do them, if you align it up right, they all build you to the next step in your career. So my first major milestone was commanding a squadron. Okay. Right? Um, and if you do really well commanding a squadron, you could have a shot at commanding the entire air wing, which is all the squadrons on the carrier, or commanding the carrier itself. Um, and so my, I was fortunate. I, I did well as a squadron commander. Uh, I also, yeah, you had to have the academic uh, resume to, to survive nuclear power school. Okay. Because they make you a go. Uh, they don't, let's just hand you two nuclear reactors without making sure you know. Is that what you learned in Harvard? How to use them. No, no. I, okay. I, I did uh, strategy and policy, public administration at Harvard. Okay. Um, <clears throat> no, you have to go to school a year and a half of, of school, Naval Nuclear Power School. And so you did so that? I'm a nu Naval Nuclear Engineer. <laughs> As a, pol as a poli sci major <laughs> with a Bachelor of Arts degree in college, uh, I, I strapped this thing on and worked my tail off. Uh, oh my gosh. 44 years old, I'm going through school, and all the other students in the class are, uh, you know, 23 year old, brand new ensigns just entering the Navy. And they're doing their algebra, you know, upside down in their sleep. And I'm, I'm looking at a negative exponent going, what is that? What do I do with that? What's, how, do I, how do I divide by? So, yeah, it was a lot of work. I bet. It was a lot of work. Uh, but I learned, a lot. I learned a ton. And okay. so you get qualified through, through nuclear power school. Then you're uh, executive officer of a carrier. So I went to George H.W. Bush while it was being built in, in Newport News. Okay. That's where I met the pre President 41 a few, uh, several times. All right, yes. Uh, the, after that, uh, I went to Japan for two years. How is that? Commanded a ship out there. You're moving all, you're doing all this kind of stuff, so how's that working? Because you have three sons, right? Yeah. And a wife, and mm, how, yeah. share a little bit how they had yeah. to kind of. That was awkward. I, I sold my wife an elaborate lie. I didn't, I didn't know it was a lie at the time, but it turned out to be a lie. I said, honey, if we get in the nuclear power track, I go to school, I'm exo of a carrier, I get a deep draft shipped, and then maybe I get a carrier. That's like a nine-year thing, that, that path. Okay. So I'll buy you a nice house in Norfolk, in Virginia. We'll be there for nine years. You know, it'll be great. She's like, oh, that sounds pretty good. Because yeah, okay. we hadn't had a house that was our own forever. Yeah, because right? you guys are yeah, moving Yeah, right, doing. So we bought this nice old colonial in Norfolk. I'm going to uh, be XO there for a couple of years, then I, I'll get a deep draft ship for two years, probably in Norfolk, because there are a bunch of available ships there. Okay. And then I get a carrier in Norfolk, I'm in there three, another three or so years. It's a big, long, big, long stint. Well, what happens? They send me to Japan for my carrier. For I my, know. For my ship. So, so you, go to, you packed so up the family and took them with I you, packed right? packed up the family. She didn't want to go. She didn't want to go? Oh yeah. my gosh, okay. But now, she it's, loved her, it. it's her favorite tour, right? She, she loved it. She yeah. absolutely loved it. So, yeah, uh, we had a great time there. We well, she well, time. luckily she was an artist, so she was able to pack up and move and be able to raise a family. If anybody knows, his wife is a 
is a great artist. Um, she's entered, uh, she has her art, was an art, art prize just last year. Mm -hmm. But she was able to do that. So it wasn't like she was, she had a certain career that she had to, you know, have her stay stable and, and do that. So you guys kind of made a deal, right? And we're going to yeah. jump I mean, on. That's a big part of it why we've survived 25 years of marriage and me being gone so much is that uh, she does paint, she loves painting, she tends not to paint much when I'm around, but then when I'm gone, then she'll paint a lot. Right, right. So she's got things to do uh, while I'm gone that, that she enjoys and she's wonderful at. So uh, that's part of what keeps me out of trouble when I'm gone for such long periods of time, yeah. Is that one of, the, um, so let's talk about when you were in Japan, right? Mm -hmm. And what exactly did you do in Japan again? Were I was the CEO of USS Blue Ridge, which okay. is the flagship for the Seventh Fleet. Okay. So it's, it, you know, it's a the carrier is about eleven hundred foot, hundred thousand ton, big giant ship. Uh, Blue Ridge is kind of a training. Okay. Training wheel ship. All it's right. Only six hundred feet. Only <laughs> only a thousand people. You only a um, thousand people. Yeah, yeah. Still still pretty scary. Right. Uh, and it was the flagship for the three star. So uh, you get to learn how to work under pressure with a three star looking over your shoulder um watching you watching you maneuver the ship so so, you, fun. so it was this year and a half and then you got your training and then you went on to to be the captain of the u.s and then i went to ronald reagan that's to right. ronald reagan that's right. now let's, let's get to that because that one's that one's big so let's talk about how many men and women that you oversaw you know what did you you know what was your what your duties where were you you know where did you sail where was it so, so let's start there. Yeah, that's a that's a, that's a big question. Is uh, it? <laughs> so the crew is about three thousand, and then the air wing is another fifteen hundred or so, and then the flag staff uh, is another two fifty three hundred. So on deployment, you're almost five thousand people full full up on, when you're on when on a long deployment. Five thousand people. <clears throat> How do you, yeah. Let Let me ask you, since you you're, you're the leader, what what was some of the things you had to deal with the most? Was it just the? the you just had to be ready to give a speech at any moment. <laughs> Because right, wherever you go, wherever you go, whatever you go see, it's like, oh, Captain, do you mind saying a few words? Oh, sure. You know, you, so really? You be, oh, okay. Yeah, you got to be ready. You got. You have to have your uh, what's on your mind, what the key things you want to communicate to the crew. Okay. You have to sort of always have them ready. Right. You and know. you were deployed. How long were you out when you when you went out in, on a mission, or you uh, went out and we, the major deployment I did was was 2011. We deployed for. We were really gone the whole year. Uh, we came back for. I was in command of Reagan for 36 months. I was gone 29 of them. With your with your family, you were out. I was gone 29 of them. Really? Yeah. Now it was a little unique because uh, I did the long deployment. We came back for a few months. Then we went to Seattle, Washington, for a major a, a yard availability where we put the ship on in the dry dock. Okay. So we were up in Seattle for 14 months uh, at the middle, back two thirds of my career, my tour. So I, occasionally I get home for the weekend at least. Right. I wasn't on the other side of the world, but I was still gone. Are we so. dealing with, um, being the captain, do you hear about other, personally, I mean, there's probably people that their marriage didn't fare as well mm -hmm, mm -hmm. On, under those conditions. Mm -hmm. But when they do go decide to sign on to that, they really are out for like six to eight months at a time. They're away from their families. Yeah, carrier deployment is minimum six. Six but, months, yeah. okay. Unless we get fancy and we, we've done a, some trickery occasionally where we do a couple three-monthers with a break. But generally it's six. I, Mine in 2011 was pushing nine, so it was a long time. It was a long time. Yeah. Well, I give Laura, I mean, well, that's probably why, you know, the spouses um, that are, you know, part of all of this, you know, you have to, you have to give them a little, got to give them credit. Yeah. That's a lot of you being yeah. gone, right? Yeah. Well, Especially kids. Yeah, her and my kids, right? Right. So, so there were years of the boy's life, I just, you know, that are voids, right, where I wasn't around at all mm -hmm. uh, for them, so. Uh, Alex, my youngest, uh, is just starting Michigan. In fact, he's doing orientation. Laura's picking right him now. up today. Yeah. Um, he's the only one I could do things like scouting with, that kind of thing, because then I was off my tour on Reagan. I was actually home in uh, the Pentagon my last tour before I retired. So, yeah, so I, we, we missed lots of things, right? They weren't on the baseball team. They weren't the star of the track right. team or any of those kind of things. But they must got other skill, things that they picked up and learned. Uh, they're worldly. Yeah, they're worldly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and they've lived. They've lived in the Carolinas, Virginia, California, right, right. here yeah. now, uh, Japan. They've been to Hong Kong. They've been uh, overseas. So yeah. Okay. Now.